This lecture is going to introduce logistic regression. So let's start with what logistic regression does. Logistic regression is used whenever you have a categorical dependent variable. Now we're going to cover um, a special case of that more general situation is where the which is where the dependent variable is dichotomous. Okay, so the um, we're trying to predict a yes or a no, and this could come up in a lot of different situations. So we could have an email, and we want to classify it as being spam or not spam. So that would be a yes-no situation. We could have a variety of um, user characteristics and visitor characteristics, and we want to predict whether or not this visitor will click on a display ad that's on a website. So click or not click is a you know yes no response variable. Um, we may have um, various tumors and we want to be able to classify them as cancerous or not cancerous. Those are all that's a that's another example of a yes no response variable. So how do we predict um, a yes no response variable? We could you know you might say let's just use logistic regression, but logistic regression is problematic for you know three main reasons. So the first reason is that um, you know I, I really want to know what is the probability that this email is spam or what is the probability that this tumor is cancerous. And so the, the dependent variable, you know, probabilities have to be between zero and one, yet a, you know, a line is unbounded. So I've drawn a, a picture in R over here. Let's say I have a single predictor, one X, and my y is going to take value 0 or 1. All right. So uh, for each you know, uh, email, it's either a 1, meaning spam, or it's not spam, which in which case we denote it by 0. Now, let's say that the relationship between the probability that y is 1 and x, you know, we, we naively throw this line on it. Now, the problem with this is you have a an area up here where the predicted values exceed 1. And we all know we can't have probabilities greater than 1. Down in this region, we have probabilities, you know, predicted values that would be less than 0, and we can't have probabilities that are less than 0. All right, so the point is uh, linear regression is problematic because you know, lines are unbounded. Probabilities have to be between 0 and 1. Now there's two other criticisms that are, um, I, I, I would say they're less important, but they are certainly problems. Okay, so the next one is that the residuals can only take two values. I'm just going to put some residuals up on my plot as long as I have this here. So let's do an AB line, let's put a vertical line at 3. Okay, so let's look at if x were 3. My prediction would be this point, if I use the line. Um, however, there are only two possible residuals. So if the true value is 1, this would be my residual. If the true value is 0, that's my residual. So, it, you know, it only takes, the residuals only take two values. The classical linear model assumes that you've got a normal distribution and normal curves uh, don't take only two values. They, they take any real number. Right? So we don't have normal residuals. Now a third problem is that the variance of these residuals um, is going to depend on the mean. Okay, so remember that it, you know, these residuals are, are like coin flips. You know, so this is heads, that's tails. You know, so you have two possible values, two possible outcomes, heads or tails. Um, the chance that it's this is pi and the other one is 1 minus pi. All right, now the variance of those residuals, if you remember the binomial distribution, is pi times 1 minus pi, okay, which means that the variance of these residuals depend on the mean. Now we could plot that. I made myself some, uh, some p values, so note p goes from uh, 0 0.05 to 0 0.95, I could plot p 
against, let's do p times 1 minus p. So this would be the variance. And let's make the type equals L. All right, so we get a parabola. And what this says is the variance um, is greatest when uh, the probability is 0.5. As you approach 0 or 1, the variance becomes much smaller. So the, the variance, be the uh, residuals become much more homogeneous. All right, so that, those are the problems that we have using um, linear regression whenever we have a dichotomous outcome. So what do we do? Two possible solutions that are discriminant analysis and logistic regression. We're going to talk about logistic regression today. Okay, so what is logistic regression? Here's the, the formal model. I'm going to assume that we have n pairs, and we'll call them x1, y1 through xn, yn. Same setup as simple linear regression with one exception. The one exception is I'm going to assume that each one of these y's takes only two possible values. So I observe an outcome that is either yes or one uh, or no, which would be zero. All right, so spam, not spam, cancerous, benign, and so forth. Now, let's say that pi i is going to be the expected value of y, which means that it's really the probability that subject i is a yes. So subject i could be an email, could be a tumor, what, you know, pi sub i is the, um, is, is the uh, probability be yes. All right. We'd like to model these pi i's directly, but we have all sorts of problems. We go out of bounds, heteroscedastic errors, non-normal. Okay, so in order to address the, the first problem, so the, the fact that lines go out of bounds, the general approach is to transform these pi's. Okay, so we, what we want to do is find a transformation that prevents us from going out of bounds. Now there's quite a few functions that would do this. Perhaps the most uh, commonly used is called the logit function, or the log odds ratio. All right, so what we're going to do is transform y as follows and model that then as a fun as a linear function of our predictors. All right, let's take apart this odds log odds ratio. Let's start with odds. So the odds of something occurring are just the ratio of the probability it happens to the probability it doesn't happen. So you know you, you can read about um, the odds of some team winning a, winning a, a playoff game could be three to two. So what is what what do three to two odds means? It means three chances they win to two chances they lose. So if you think about it, then there would be three fifths or sixty percent probability of them winning. Now let's think about what happens when we compute these odds. So when we compute odds. Um, Small values, so small values of pi, will have small odds, right? So if I took, say, 1%, very rare event, if I take 1% divide by 99%, I get something really close to 1%. Okay, so small probabilities produce small odds. What about large probabilities? So something that's very likely to happen. If I take 0.99 divide by... 0 0.01, I get what, 99? Okay, so 99 divided by 0 0.01, you get 99. So as pi approaches 1, this denominator goes to 0 and the odds go to infinity. All right, so we've just solved the out-of-bounds problem on one side of the distribution. Now, let's go just look at this. I, I made these values from... 0.05 to 0.95, these would be probabilities. If I take p divided by 1 minus p, so here are the odds. Notice, just like we said, you know, the, the odds start at close to, you know, zero, and they get big. So 
we don't have to worry about going out of bounds if we uh, on the on the one end if we use the odds ratio. So, but odds can't be negative. So what do we do about that? Well, in order to you know not go out of bounds on the other side, we take the log. Now remember, values between zero and one have negative logs. Well, values greater than one have positive logs. The log of one is zero. So let's go take the log of this ratio. So the log of that, and what you'll see is that the first values are all negative, and they, they'll actually go to negative infinity as p goes to zero. This corresponds to the value 0.5. If you take 0.5 divided by 1 minus 0.5, you get 1. What's the log of 1? Well, it's 0. And then on the other side, you get positive values that actually go to infinity as pi goes to infinity. Now we could plot this. Let's do that. So if I plot p against the log odds ratio, you get a function that looks like this. Now I should, should have probably taken my probabilities a little closer, but it, it's, a, it's, it's a, a curve. Now I actually took it out much closer over here. I took it closer to 0 and 1. And so this, what you're seeing in this graph is everything from about here to here, the middle section of this. All right, so a couple things that are really important about this graph. The first is that it is strictly monotonic. Okay, so as p gets bigger, the log odds get bigger and vice versa. So whenever we talk about the log odds getting bigger, that implies p is getting bigger. Okay, so in, in a sense, we can think of these things um, directionally the same. Now, what that means is, for example, if I have a positive beta, positive beta means uh, for additional, you know, additional unit of x, the log odds go up by beta. But, you know, we don't like to think in log odds, we like to think in probabilities. Since there's this monotonic relationship, strictly monotonic relationship, we can conclude that, you know, when the log odds get bigger, so do the probabilities. So as x increases, the probability of y increases. So literally, the log odds go up, but because of this monotonic relationship, we can also say the probabilities go up for positive beta. All right, so let's, let's stay focused on, on the big ideas. So big idea number one is we got this problem, the you know linear regression would go out of bounds. We've just fixed that by taking the log odds ratio. What do we do about the other two problems? So we have non-normal residuals with heteroscedastic error variance. The solution to that is going to be to use a different estimation method called maximum likelihood. I have another video that will um, give you a taste of what maximum likelihood's about. But let's not um, let's not go there now. You can watch that video at your at your leisure. All right. Now, so let's say I've estimated a logistic regression model. So I know some slope and I know some intercept, the intercept being alpha, the slope being beta. Um, I can plug in an x and get some estimate of the log odds ratio, but I don't want to know the log odds ratio. I want to know the probability. Okay, so how do I get from, you know, to, from these log odds to probabilities? Well, the answer is we have to do a little bit of messy algebra, and we have to solve this equation for pi, or pi hat, whatever you want to call it. Now, there's a tradition in statistics to call this quantity eta. So eta is simply you know, the, the linear predictor. There's another name for this. So here we have a linear predictor based on x. It gives us an estimate of the log odds. All right, so think of this as eta. Now, what we have to do is solve this equation. Let's exponentiate both sides. Fine, uh, we've done that. Now, let's multiply both sides by 1 minus pi. So that you get this equation. Now, we need to get all of our pi's on one side. So I did that. 
and then I factored the pi out. Let's divide both sides then to isolate the pi, and here's what we get. Now another thing that we usually do then is to multiply this thing by e to the negative eta. If you multiply, sorry, e to the negative eta over e to the negative eta, and if you do that, you end up with this equation. So this is a really important equation. It undoes the log odds. So I, I like to call this the unlogit function. You know, this, this, this is the logit, the log odds ratio. Uh, this unlogits it. It's the inverse function. It has a lot of, um, of other names. So when we get to neural networks, we're going to call this a squashing function. It squashes a, a signal that can be from any real value to this interval 0 to 1. Well, it's also called a sigmoidal function. It's kind of S-shaped in a, in a weird way. All right. Um, so in my next video, we will do a problem and uh, put this stuff to use.